rent's too high and the market's too low. We ask for credit and they all say no. We got good people and they all know well what the poor old farmer makes they can't sell now. By 1933, prices for farm products in Depression America were at rock bottom. In the South, because of overproduction, cotton growers lost money on every acre they planted. I remember my grandfather saying uh, that he knew at the start of the year that he was going to lose $50,000. The landlords were going broke. $50,000 in those days was a lot of money. In the plantation system, trouble at the top was often read on the faces of people at the bottom. The tenant farmers who worked someone else's land with their own mules, tools, and seed paid one quarter of their cotton crop as rent. And further down the ladder, the sharecroppers, who could furnish nothing but their labor, paid fully half their crop as rent. All the renters, poor blacks and poor whites, were part of a system that had replaced slavery after the Civil War. When I was a child, I started working in the field at eight. And you didn't go to school until the season was over for the crop. They would have two months in July and August you could go to school. Then you had to stop and work until about the last of December or the first of January. When I started working, it was cotton picking time. I had to pick a hundred pounds of cotton in one day. Sharecroppers had no voice. You made your crop, you gathered it, and when it was all in, the boss told you how much cotton you made and how much money you owed and how much you got, if any. You, you didn't figure with the boss. Your pencil didn't count. He did all the figuring. And when he got through, you would say, yes, sir. I'll take it. It was considered an affront if a tenant asked the landlord to see the books, or to see the charges made against him. It was a challenge to the landlord's uh, integrity. And, of course, there were m many wrongs committed by, by landlords who would... Who would doctor the books to see that the amount charged would certainly take care of all that the tenant had coming. That cropping's all right, provided the share cropper finds the right land the right land. My experience is nine times out of ten, he finds the wrong man the wrong land. That being the case, he just can't make a living to save his life. Raggedy, raggedy, are we? Just as raggedy as raggedy can be. We don't get nothing for our labor. So raggedy, raggedy are we. Hungry, hungry are we. Just as hungry as hungry can be. We don't get nothing for our labor. So hungry, hungry are we. The myth is that the landlords, if they hadn't been so stingy, so cruel, so mean, the sharecroppers would have had a very happy, idyllic life. They could have lived well. It's just not true. Everybody, the Great Depression was destroying the whole uh, rural economy. The Agricultural Adjustment Act, or AAA, was President Roosevelt's program to save America's farms. They're plowing up cotton instead of picking it down Dixie Way as a part of President Roosevelt's stupendous program to stop excessive production and boost prices. These mules, long trained to walk between the plants, are now driven right over them. 700,000 farms in 16 states are destroying 9 million acres of the fluffy stuff. In return, the government is distributing $120 million to the cotton planters to compensate them for waste land. Happy days! In the first year of Roosevelt's crop reduction program, the AAA signed over a million contracts with cotton farmers. In the South, the government issued checks directly to the planters and landlords, 
who were then supposed to share their payments with their tenants and sharecroppers. The landowners were pleased. They thought it was, well, without it, they'd gone broke. So they were very pleased with it, and it, it worked fine with them. Tenants would say if they were unhappy, they didn't think that they were getting their fair share. And, of course, those on the lower down, the sharecroppers, thought they just were gouged. They didn't get anything. The sharecroppers found an advocate in Socialist Party leader Norman Thomas, who accused Roosevelt's New Deal of favoring the rich over the poor. In the small delta town of Tyranza, Arkansas, Thomas met with fellow socialists Clay East, who ran a local gas station, and H. L. Mitchell, owner of a dry cleaning business. In uh, February of 1934, Norman Thomas paid a visit to Arkansas and saw the conditions of what was happening to the people, and he advised Clay East and I to help the sharecroppers form an organization of their own to fight for their rights under the Agricultural Adjustment Act. In July 1934, East and Mitchell called a secret meeting at the Sunnyside Schoolhouse, three miles outside of Taranza. Eighteen men attended, eleven white, seven black. One man, Mitch told me, got up, a white man, who said that he had belonged to the Ku Klux Klan in the past, and uh, uh, that, however, he felt that this was a situation where they were all in this together, and there wasn't any way to get out except together, and he was all for having a union of black and white sharecroppers. The men knew they were risking their lives. Fifteen years earlier in Elaine, Arkansas, at least 25 black sharecroppers had been killed by planters for union organizing. And the idea of blacks and whites in the same union was an affront to Southern tradition, breaking all the rules of racial segregation. Another major discussion was whether or not they should carry guns, just in, in terms of showing self-defense, showing that they also had some rights, because there were guns every place. Whenever the sheriffs showed up, or the planters, they all carried guns. It was very much a part of the almost mystique of power that was frightening and controlling. And I told him, don't bring no gun to these meetings. I said, if we start that stuff, they, that we don't stand a chance in the world. They'd send a militia in here, anybody, and uh, just don't think about fighting back. So actually... I was strictly against it. Soon after the first meeting, H. L. Mitchell went public and incorporated the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, the STFU. Retaliation was almost immediate. In a move to stop the new union, many towns in the Arkansas Delta passed ordinances against public gatherings. When we met at night, we were so afraid until we had watchmen's out. There would be always three or four men depended on the size of the place where we met. Sometimes we met in homes, and they would be out watching to see if any strange person would come up, and they'd have a way of giving a signal. And if they did, we would be having us either Bible study class. If not that, we'd be playing a friendly card game. If it was a card game, they'd stand there and watch for a while. And maybe... If it was good moonshine whiskey, they'd take a drink or two. You niggas make sure y'all don't have no union going on around you. As long as y'all doing this, this is all right. They didn't know what we were really doing. They didn't know we were organizing a union. So in some cases, they helped us by saying, go ahead, <laughs> as long as you do what you do. <laughs> all through the fall of 1934, STFU organizers continued the dangerous work of recruiting. By year's end, the union claimed more than 1,000 members. Planters responded by evicting those suspected of union activity. 
In early 1935, H. L. Mitchell and four other union members met with Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace to ask him to stop the evictions and to see to it that the tenants and sharecroppers received their share of the government payments. Mitch uh, was very much disappointed because Wallace had sided in with the uh, planter-type boys, and we figured that he would side with us and maybe give us some help. But he didn't. He was against us. Some new dealers in the Department of Agriculture did side with the STFU. Their efforts to help the sharecroppers forced a showdown within the AAA. Well, one of the reasons we were fired is because Jerome Frank, Lee Pressman, and some of the rest of us tried to see to it that these sharecroppers got something approaching a square deal. And darn near half the cases, maybe more, the sharecroppers didn't get a nickel of the benefit payments. The landlords pocketed them all. But actually, back of it is politics. It would be political suicide to go against the planters. They're the Democrats who have the real power in the Cotton South. One of the most powerful Democrats was Arkansas Senator Joseph Robinson, who had helped pass much of Roosevelt's New Deal legislation. He was really the representative of the vested interest, the, the utility group, the large landowners, the banks. Now, if you were a person that didn't have any money, like a sharecropper, what the heck, he didn't care about it. That sharecropper didn't vote. You have to remember that in those days, we voted by registration, and you had to buy a poll tax, and you had to pay a dollar for it. Sharecropper didn't have a dollar to spend on it. In June 1935, the New Deal Congress passed the Wagner Act. Hailed as a milestone for labor, it offered federal protection for the right to organize unions. But planters convinced Congress to exclude agricultural workers. With STFU members denied federal protection, the landlords continued their campaign of terror. Intimidation took many forms. If it happened after dark, the perpetrators were always called night riders. My mother and father were made to lie down on their front porch by a man with a shotgun and held there almost until dawn as punishment and, and, uh, and intimidation. Families of the organizers were very precariously situated. Many times their homes were shot up. Bullets would fly through, people would crash to the floor. The threat of violence was always present. They came in with shotguns and straps and pistols and they did what they figured it would take to do to break up the Union. Certainly in my part of the South, the Union organizers had no one to turn to in terms of government. Certainly they couldn't have turned to the county sheriff, uh, to, the, to the town marshal, to the state government, not at that time. And so far as the federal power is concerned, it's been explained to me very clearly over and over again the vacuum that they felt that there was no federal presence here convinced they had to move forward alone stfu members called a cotton picker strike for higher wages during the fall of 1935 let them throw us in jail if they want to We'll fill every jail in Arkansas. But get off the fields and stay off until the bosses give in. The March of Time decided to make a film and reenact scenes from the strike and um, other aspects of the union organization. There were some actors, some people who, who were uh, actually hired to do a few of the scenes. However, there were scenes with real staff members. And we're still the Southern Tennis Farmers Union and next a uh, country worthwhile to live in. To keep workers out of the fields, the STFU started rumors 
that the union was shooting anyone caught picking cotton during the strike. After 10 days, the landlords gave in and were forced to raise wages. As the news of the STFU victory spread, new union locals opened in Missouri, Mississippi, Texas, and Tennessee. Membership grew to 25,000. If the plan is in the way, we're going to roll it over him, going to roll it over him, going to roll it over him. If the plan is in the way, we're going to roll it over him, going to roll the union on. The STFU victory was short-lived. In December 1935, plantation owner C.H. Dibble ordered 100 union members off his land. They start at one house and they keep going from house to house until they get a wagon load. Then they'd carry it, dump it out on the road and come back and get another load. We got finished about first dark. Everybody's furniture was together and you had to ramble through everything to try to find yours. And one day, car came by, man got out and put a package in a paper bag on a table and got back in the car and sped away. Then one of the men walked up to the table and he picked up the package and when he opened it up there were about six or eight sticks of dynamite in there and it had a note attached and the note said, Mr. Nigger, take your woman and your children and get out of here or we're gonna blow you up. On January 16th, when evicted sharecroppers gathered at a church near Earl, Arkansas, two local law officers broke into the meeting. They shot two men in the back and beat another unconscious. The next day, evicted families defiantly met again, this time with the Reverend Howard Kester and union attorney Herman Goldberger. It was jammed with men, women, and children. And I gather three or four hundred as I recall people packed in that church and through the back doors of the church burst a crowd of men with guns uh, about 13 or 14 of them as I recall and they stormed the building and people were so terrified that they came out of the windows taking sash and glass and all with them I saw them strike people I saw them strike one old man I vividly remember that People were just running and getting away as fast as they could. And then two men came out, uh, one on each side of, of Kester and Goldberger, and brought them to the car, um, put them in it, got on the running board. My father drove where they told him to, of course, out in the woods. And the man on his side, by the driver's seat, was holding a gun to his temple. We'd heard of lynches and, and seen pictures of them, but this is the first time I knew what it might be really like because there was a palpable feeling of hate and fear. There was a nice big tree with some handy limbs, and one of the men had a rope with a noose in it. My father, he was scared to death, just scared to death. So he began to talk with them about quickly about what might happen if they killed him. He said, I'm from out of state, and you boys better remember that um, if anything happens to me, the FBI will be in here. Reason prevailed, and they threatened us with uh, 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 worse than death if we ever came back, uh, and uh, left us at the border between uh, um, Arkansas and uh, Memphis. There is mean things happening in this land. There is mean things happening in this land. That planter stole the people off the land where many years they had spent. And in the cold, hot winter, they had to live in tents. There By April 1936, in terrorism land. in Arkansas there was making national headlines. The STFU and its supporters thought at last the federal government might intervene. The Union had several hopes from the federal government. On a major level, they wanted the government to stand for 
and act out justice and to see to it that people got their rights and got the kind of protection from the law regardless of economic circumstances. So on the larger level, it was important that the government, federal government, take a stance that would say to everybody else, including the planter system, there is law and order in this country, and it will be on the side of people who do what is legal and proper. Union members, still under attack, now asked for a meeting with President Roosevelt during his June 10th trip to Little Rock. Governor Patel, my friends of Arkansas, for me this has been a glorious day and this is a splendid climax. In the past, Roosevelt had privately urged Arkansas leaders to end the violence against the croppers. But on this day, he chose to publicly honor a friend of the planters, the man who was the New Deal's strongest ally in the Senate. No man deserves greater credit, greater credit for loyal devotion to the great cause of humanity than my old friend and associate, Senator Joseph B. Robinson. The STFU request for a meeting with the president was denied. He came down here and made that speech at Little Rock. Norman Thomas had tried his best to persuade him to espouse the cause of the sharecropper and attending union outfit. He ignored that altogether. His uh, contribution to the welfare of the poor people in Arkansas, the sharecropper, the one that was starving and needed, was just maybe is it from one to ten, possibly he'd register two. He really wasn't interested in them. He was interested in where the power was. He was a politician, one of the best we ever had. The Union would wait two more years for a meaningful victory. It came in 1938 when the government at last agreed to send payments directly to tenants and croppers. But the new policy helped very few. Cotton planters in Missouri, just north of the Arkansas Delta, evicted their remaining tenants so the planters could continue to keep all the government money for themselves. No more morning. No more morning. No out a while and before I'll be a slave I'll be buried in my grave take my place with those who love and fought before 251 evicted families many of them members of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union camped on Missouri highways in protest the STFU's days as an active union were nearly over and before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Take my place with those who love and fought before. My father was aware of the fact that as an instrument to change the lives of the sharecroppers in any substantive and permanent way, the Southern Tenant Farmers Union was a dismal failure. But he believed that it taught all those people who were involved in it to very important lessons. One, that they could fight and with dignity. And two, that blacks and whites could fight together. Individually, they felt that they did not accomplish a lot. They suffered, they struggled, but they came together and they really stood up and they stood up for what they believed in. And that in itself, they saw as a step toward freedom. New Deal democracy faced a different kind of test in the steel towns of the north. Company towns like Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, where the Jones and Laughlin Mill stretched for four miles along the Ohio River. In the midst of the Depression, with millions unemployed nationwide, 
j and l provided jobs for a town it had literally built and own the main industry in town of course was j and l in fact it was a company town j and l built the town laid the town out and were responsible to see that everything in l equipo was conducted in a good solid fashion for the benefit of the citizens of the town El Equipo people used to pour in from all over the world. Immigrants from Italy, Serbians, Yugoslavians, Irish people, blacks from down south would come up, work in the steel mills. And the town was one of the busiest towns in western Pennsylvania. The town itself was broken up and you had a segregated place for blacks, a segregated place for, for Englishmen, for Italians. Uh, in other words, the whites were not all together. They were segregated among themselves because there were divisions there. Those areas, no black person ever walked after dark. In fact, you had a hell of a time getting around there during the day. They arrested you, take you down to a police station, and if you didn't answer the right question, they might hit you a few times on the head. If you worked in JNL, they arrest you for loitering and they take ten dollars out of your pay. To work at JNL's Aliquippa Mill, people had to follow rules established by Tom Girdler, who in the 1920s had been superintendent and later president of the company. During Girdler's time, Aliquippa earned a reputation as a tough anti-union town. He worked closely with the local Republican Party machine and police to establish what he called a benevolent dictatorship. The company, Jones and Lawson Steel Corporation, operated a very strict policy of control, of thought control and of human activity control. And George Izoski was a specific case it was where he was uh, committed to an insane asylum in, in western Pennsylvania uh, because he was uh, unionizing, attempting to unionize uh, the, the steel workers. They were the controlling power because they had the jobs, they had the say-so over everything, and there was nothing that people could do, you know, unless they really wanted to take a chance at losing their jobs. But as long as you followed their rules, which was keep your mouth shut, don't talk against JNL, don't join any unions. You were in good shape. In 1933, Roosevelt's National Recovery Act recognized the right of industrial workers to form unions. Union leaders began a campaign for higher wages, an eight-hour workday, and job security. But when organizers arrived in Aliquippa, JNL, drove them out of town. In nearby Ambridge, 50 J&L guards joined a sheriff's posse financed by local steel companies. On October 5, 1933, they confronted strikers at the Spang Shalfat Steelworks. killed, 20 wounded. The NRA had failed to protect workers' rights to organize unions. More than a year later, in an effort to limit strike violence and protect labor, Congress passed the Wagner Act. Although it did not cover farm workers, it promoted collective bargaining in the industrial workplace and gave the National Labor Relations Board the power to stop unfair labor practices by employers. When the Wagner was passed, this was a kind of renaissance for those of us who had undergone all of this uh, medieval treatment in our workplaces. And uh, we uh, idolized 
President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We thought he was one of the greatest men ever born. And uh, he renewed our lives, our inspiration, uh, especially in our unions. Many corporate leaders were outraged by the Wagner Act and President Roosevelt. In Aliquippa, J and L defied the new law. The legal struggle would go all the way to the Supreme Court. Tom Girdler, now head of Republic Steel, saw the Wagner Act as a threat to his relationship with his employees. Girdler had built Republic Steel into a profitable powerhouse. He wanted no government interference. Father thought Franklin Roosevelt was a disaster. It was during the Roosevelt years that the adversarial relationship between the unions and the companies was promoted to the greatest extent by the unions and backed by the government. You may say that I John L. Lewis, president of the United Mine Workers, saw the Wagner Act as an opportunity to organize all industrial workers including the millions of factory workers and blacks and immigrants excluded by the American Federation of Labor. Lewis broke with the AFL and formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. The workers of this country want representation. They want organization. They want participation. They want protection. They want employment. And they're going to have those things through the leadership and the instrumentality of this new labor movement that you're forging. There is power, there is power in the land of John L. Lewis's main target was the steel industry, the citadel of anti-unionism. Steel underlay the whole industrial American operation. At the time when we were a country of smokestack industry, we needed steel to make the automobiles. We needed steel for all the purposes of industry. If there was no steel, there was no industry. This was the heart of the matter. In June 1936, Lewis formed the Steel Workers Organizing Committee, SWAC. The CIO pledged a half million dollars to begin the battle with the steel companies. Lewis chose Phil Murray, vice president of the mine workers, to head SWAC. Murray broke with tradition by including blacks and communists on his organizing team. There was a ferment that's hard to imagine. People ran out of cards. You know, you went out to organize. You didn't have to plead with people and convince them. They grabbed the cards. They were ready. They'd been long ready. This was a depression. They wanted something done. I didn't, you know, never attended a union meeting before. And there was an outside guard. And this guard... Uh, asked me where I was going. I said, is this a meeting of 1014? He said, yeah. I said, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a member. I'd like to go. He said, you know the password? I said, what password? Never heard of a password. So uh, he looked at me, and I guess he recognized I was sincere. He said, well, look, I'm going to give you the password. You're not to repeat it to anybody, whether they're members of the union or not. You're not to write it on anything. You have to memorize it. I said, okay. And he whispered to me, expansion. I know it to this day, I know it. In the 1936 presidential election, big business spent heavily to defeat Roosevelt and end the advance of unions. But labor fought back. Unlike the sharecroppers in the South, union members in the North had the vote. The CIO held hundreds of rallies for the president and registered thousands of new voters. Seeking their support, Roosevelt made labor's enemies his own. That this concentration of economic power 
in all embracing corporations does not represent private enterprise as we Americans cherish it and propose to foster it. On the contrary, it represents private enterprise, which has become a kind of private government and is a power unto itself, a regimentation of other people's money and other people's lives. The uh, Roosevelt administration did everything they could to further the interest of the working people. By the working people, I mean the union people, because there was more votes there than there were at any other place else, and I think it was primarily for that reason. Two months after Roosevelt's landslide victory, John L. Lewis began secret negotiations with Myron Taylor, chairman of America's biggest steel corporation, U.S. Steel. Taylor had watched CIO sit-down strikers win union recognition after stopping production at General Motors. He did not want to risk a production shutdown at U.S. Steel. sign an agreement with a great steel corporation. This is the first time in the history of the industry that a subsidiary of the United States Steel Corporation effected a bargaining agreement, an independent trade union. Well, my father and all the heads of the small steel company, Little Steel, Bethlehem Steel, Weirton, were all utterly disgusted and dismayed that Byron Taylor would sign a contract with the CIO. The smaller steel companies, known as Little Steel, vowed to stop the CIO. But in April 1937, Little Steel executives were stunned when the Supreme Court ruled against JNL and upheld the Wagner Act. Workers in Little Steel now demanded union contracts. Throughout Little Steel, what they wanted simply was what Big Steel already had. The people who were making steel for U.S. Steel were getting certain kinds, shorter hours, higher wages, certain kinds of protections. I don't know what all was in their contract, but it was a contract that for the first time gave the workers there some kind of recognition and, and had a mechanism to discuss grievances, a mechanism to try to raise wages. None of that existed in Little Steel. Encouraged by the victory in the Supreme Court, Aliquippa steel workers exercised their rights by striking at JNL, where Tom Girdler's old anti-union system still prevailed. The company had been stockpiling munitions in anticipation of a violent strike. The 37 strike came about only because we asked the company to recognize the CIO is as, as, as the only representative of the workers, and the company turned us down. And uh, we were well prepared. We had the uh, truck on the side with weapons because the other side was all armed. They were legal, we weren't. We were really fighting for this union, and we were down at the JNL tunnel, and here comes this little old mail car. Of course, we stopped, and we weren't letting anybody in there. So this guy insisted on going in there. And these people just grabbed that mail truck and upset it right down. And there was no mail in there. There was sandwiches in there. There was pop. There was stuff for them to eat and keep staying. Them little stoolies that was working for JNL got to stay in the mill as long as they wanted, as long as they could feed them. They didn't care. They, they were paying them to stay in there. If you were in a house and somebody came along and stood at the front door with a gun and said, you can't get out, You'd say somebody was invading your privacy, invading your rights. In effect, that's what the unions did. They blockaded the entrance of the plant so that the people who were in there, that stayed in there, couldn't get out, couldn't get food, couldn't get mail, couldn't get to home to see their family. On the second day of the strike, Pennsylvania Governor George Earle asked to inspect the mill accompanied by strike leader Joe Timko. The message was clear. The governor would not tolerate a repeat of the shootings at Ambridge. That same day, 
Timko was called to JNL's Pittsburgh office. And they gave us what we wanted. That was our right to vote for the union of our choice. Swak won the election supervised by the National Labor Relations Board and negotiated an agreement stronger than the one at U.S. Steel. Oh, boy. Tell me about it. We were really, really happy. We had a parade. I'll tell you, that street was loaded with people going up the street, celebrating, hollering, and screaming. That was the best day of our life, I'll tell you. Swat and the steelworkers believed they had finally brought democracy to Aliquippa, and it now seemed that all of Little Steel would fall. Tom Girdler saw events in Aliquippa as a direct threat to the rights of management. In May, he spent $50,000 on arms and ammunition for Republic Steel. Girdler also prepared for a propaganda war, purchasing more than 40,000 pamphlets, which branded John L. Lewis a communist. Father's opinion of John L. Lewis was not the highest. In fact, he thought he was a louse. Father said that before he would sign a contract with John L. Lewis, he'd go back to raising apples in Indiana. Philip Murray was just as bad. The Republic cannot and will not enter into a contract, oral or written, with an irresponsible party. And the CIO, as presently constituted, is utterly irresponsible. Therefore, any discussion of this subject is futile. On May 26th, SWAC called a nationwide strike against Little Steel. The next day, Little Steel picked Tom Girdler to lead their anti-union fight. But workers believed that even Girdler could be defeated. In a show of confidence, SWAC called a Memorial Day rally in a field near Girdler's Republic Mill in South Chicago. We came out there and it was a gorgeous day, absolutely a beautiful day. People came out there like a picnic. We're going to support the steel workers and we're going to enjoy a picnic day with our families. And it looked like God shone on that idea. And at the end of whatever little party they had, someone said, look, let's go to the plant and set up a picket line. And they started walking towards the plant. And people were talking and, and holding hands, and the children were being carried by their fathers on their shoulders, I and mean, everybody was singing and joyful and very optimistic and a feeling that we're going to win this. We're really going to win it. As we came closer to the mill, the walking slowed a bit. Now, I wasn't way up in the front line. But I wasn't very far back either. And what was happening there is that the mill was completely surrounded by cordons of police. The radical elements created picket lines out there and brought people that were not connected to the plant in on the picket line. There was rumors around that it was a communist uh, movement uh, oriented and in that march uh, the city police uh, were in and protecting the uh, property of the South Chicago plant. One fellow that was out there at the time told me that he was in the line as an observer but he said there was a picket he talked to that was carrying a sign that said kill Tom Girdler. He said I asked him who's Tom Girdler said, I don't know, I just was handed this sign. I could see a few objects through the air. I could see some things being thrown. Not much, it wasn't a lot of stuff, maybe a couple of rocks, I don't know. You could see a couple of things thrown, and then suddenly, it was like the 4th of July. There was a, a dry, crackling kind of a noise that took me a moment to figure out what it was, and I realized it was gunfire. <laughs>
as the line was pushing back, I was knocked down. And then a whole number of people were piled up on top of me. And I could barely breathe. And when the shooting finally stopped, and the silence prevailed, I looked around, and I saw a battlefield. I see myself walking around there with a gray felt hat and a press card in it, and uh, with my characteristic jerky kind of motion. And I'm walking around, and I'm seeing these people lying on the ground. I'm seeing people handling them like sacks of potatoes. There was some small effort by the strikers to try to do some first aid stuff. There were no ambulances that I remember initially. They were taking them into paddy wagons. It was clear that a whole number of these people had been shot in the back. They were trying to flee, and they were still being fired at. It was uh, unfortunate, unnecessary, and uh, got completely out of hand. But to say that the company caused it is a entire fabrication and I don't know who should shoulder the blame. Ten marchers were killed and 30 wounded. News film of the incident was suppressed and not shown in movie theaters. Across the country, newspapers reported the incident as a riot by strikers inspired by communists. The gunfire at Republic Steel stopped Swak's momentum. In little steel towns across America, thousands were fired. In July, defeated steel workers began returning to the mills without a contract. I couldn't believe it because we had been uh, so victorious in auto against the most powerful adversary in the whole country the symbol of entrenched wealth and power and to have the steel workers suffer this kind of a bloody defeat and reprisal was sent shockwaves across the whole country so it was a defeat uh, but it steeled us uh, in our determination to persevere Try to sum that up, in testimony before the La Follette committee and other congressional investigations Tom Girdler blamed the Memorial Day shootings on John L. Lewis and communist agitators. Girdler contended that there had been no valid reason for the strike. Plants were running approximately full. The men were making the highest wages they ever made. Were the complaints from the men? Always <clears throat> in all manufacturing businesses, Senator, in my knowledge, particularly in the steel business, in my knowledge of 35 years, there are always minor complaints. There were no basic complaints as to wages, hours, and working conditions. There were minor complaints. When the suppressed news film was finally shown to the La Follette Committee, it offered proof that the Memorial Day incident was not a riot by strikers. The committee condemned Little Steel for violating the civil liberties of steel workers. Later, the National Labor Relations Board ordered elections in the mills owned by Little Steel. SWAC won every election, including the one at Girdler's South Chicago mill. The Steelworkers Organizing Committee, after the good old steel strike, enlarged its perspective to go into the political activity so, so that the sheriffs and the, and the judges would be on our side. We got our heads together and elected our friends into public office, you see. As a matter of fact, we would insist that every member of the union vote. We had carpools pick them up uh, as they come off their jobs take them to their polling place, let them vote. When they finish voting, take them home. We had to take over the town, we had to take over the county, we had to put ourselves in a position where we elected the sheriffs, 
so they wouldn't break up our picket lines. We had to put ourselves in a position that we could elect judges where they wouldn't serve injunctions against us to stop us from doing the things we had to do and to force the company in, in if we had a strike to give us what we thought was right. For democracy to be understood and meaningful, it has to be a participatory democracy. You have to have a role in it yourself. Now, voting once every four years for a president in Washington or every two years for a congressman is very important. But it is equally, if not more important, to be able to participate in determining under what circumstances you will sweat it out every day in the shop for eight or ten hours and what you'll be paid for it. And when you're too old to work and too young to die, whether you'll have a little something to take care of you. That kind of participatory democracy is equally important because democracy has to stand on two feet. One is political, the other is economic. In the years of the Great Depression, the federal government moved to guarantee freedom of speech, of assembly, of association for workers in the industrial north. For disenfranchised Americans in the South, it would be two decades before a new movement for civil rights would incorporate the spirit of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, renewing the fight for full citizenship for all Americans.